because if she would, then she would get maybe like really drunk. Is it like that? Is it like if you drink a lot? If no. the person you drink drinks a lot, do you get a little drunk too? I don't know how that works. It's got to work that way. In I assume sense. it works that way. Welcome to Say Smut, a literary podcast for readers and non-readers. Welcome. That's Sarah, and she loves books. And that's Hope, and she loves talking. Each episode, I break down the plots of some pretty wild books to Hope, who has not read them. And I love that we went back on track this week. This much felt, better. This felt better. It's much better. Look, I had a wild, fun time last week with mm -hmm. our um yes. jack-o-lantern smut and so this week i decided that we should do something that's less sexual and more plot based i think this is all about balance so and this is also an excuse for me to bring one of my favorite authors to the podcast actually my Yay. favorite author um olivia blake i've also heard all of the olivia 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 Blake. So I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced, but um, she writes the Atlas Six, which kind of blew up sure. on TikTok. It's my favorite book. It's pretentious. It is dark academia. It is everything you could want and more. But she does write fade to black scenes. So what that means is that there is no descriptive on page uh -huh. sex. Okay. So some interesting. Key Yes. So some people prefer this because they don't want all the graphic, but they still want adult material. So it'll infer that they had sex, but they won't actually describe penis length or how many balls or what color the penis is or, sure, you know, things sure. that we experienced in our last one. So we'll never know if these characters have four balls and pumpkin we'll spice know. jizz. We'll just never know. Well, never. But I will tell you that this one does still involve creatures. We st still are in spooky season here. Um, I... So this book is La Petite Mort, which um, in French means the little death, which some people say that's the saying for an orgasm, right? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's very sexual tension heavy. And that's why I still think I can bring it to the podcast is because it's like this you'll get we'll get into it um but this is for the girlies who may be like i don't need to hear the size of penis i don't need to hear how many balls he has i just want to have like a really good spooky ish story to listen to that has a really great plot so this is all about balance right amazing okay we love so balance very zen of us very zen so before we get too far in i want to give content warnings so there is murder in this but it is just murder it's not like i'm going to describe the murders i'm not going to um get into all it's more like it's just a plot point that this person murdered or this person was murdered okay sure there sure. is light sexual content as i mentioned there is blood and there is brief mention of the death of a parent so um if any of those are upsetting to you subscribe we'll come back next week and have something else set up for you so Yes. Are you ready? I'm so ready. Well, I guess I should give our ratings first. Um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, Story Graph, this has a 3.64. Goodreads, this has a 3.56. I gave this a 4 out of 5. I mm -hmm. thought it was delightful. It's only 200 pages. So for you girlies who need like a short book to just get into the spooky season mood, this is perfect. This is like the most ideal book in my mind to like kind of get you in that... October. Let's talk about some vampires and witches and all that stuff. Spooky season. Awesome. Okay. I gave you a little bit about um, uh, our wonderful Olivia Blake and, and just to get into why I love her um, she, on her bio, she said she focuses on what it's like to be human and the complexities that are involved with love and life. And I'm going to give a brief shout out because again, this is my favorite author. So I, I can do this and it's our podcast so we can do whatever we want. Um, on top of that, the Atlas six is like, a modern urban fantasy, but she also has another book called, um, alone with you in the ether, which is all about these two people who fall in love, who both struggle with mental illness. And as somebody oh. who has mental illness, I specifically anxiety and depression, I really resonated with the characters because it's nice. very 
real to what the experience is. And um, one of the character has bipolar disorder, which I know is goes by another name now. I can't remember what is uh, the 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 title it goes by. So I apologize for not using the correct term. But um, Olivia Blake has also mentioned struggling with that same mental illness. And she is, um, it was in the author note at the end of the book. And it was really beautiful. It was really beautiful. And she is a BIPOC author too. And so there's just a lot of elements of her that she brings to her writing that I absolutely adore. So I highly recommend Alone With You in the Ether and um, The Atlas Six. The Atlas Six is a series of three books. The third one's about to come out in January. And so that'll be a complete series. Also, she has some beautiful, beautiful artwork in her pieces. So all all of her books have artwork attached to it in some component and I'll show you some of it and we'll post some of it online um but she also has like masters of none and uh one for my enemy which are also some kind of spooky season one so she's got a lot of work out there very exciting okay now are you ready to get into the book I've never been more ready except for earlier when I was equally as ready <laughs> and then I made you listen to how much I love this author which is um, good we yes give praise good. where the praise is due that's what I say Olivia Blake, just whenever you want to send uh, send me a love note, I will absolutely accept it. Okay, so Marisa uh, has just inherited her f- a family home in New Orleans, um, which I have gotten grief from my family for calling it New Orleans and not New Orleans. Mm, sure. So I might flip back and forth on how I say it because I'm so self-conscious about it now. Fair. Um, so she inherited through her dad, but he didn't really live there. So the idea is that her grandmother mostly lived there and then her dad and her grandfather kind of left her grandma, like kind of got kicked out of the house. And we'll get into why that happened and what happened later on. So Marisa doesn't have really any attachment to this house. I should also give you a quick description of her. She is a black woman. Um, This is also confirmed in not only in the writing, but also in the images that I just told you that the artwork has. Um, She's described as tall and thin and a little lanky, but they make sure to mention she's got impeccable boobs, um, which I (laughs) think. And the thing about Olivia Blake's writing is it's so sophisticated. She is such an intelligent woman and all of her writing is so, so like, even though it's, this book is probably a little of the books I've read, this is the smuttier one that has like, along with you in the either actually has non-fade to black scenes but they are all in context of the spiraling that happens with a manic episode and stuff too um and somebody becoming obsessed with the other person so there's almost like a a real purpose to those Mm -hmm. quote-unquote smutty scenes so this one is really just sexual because everybody's hot and sexy so i kind of love this that olivia blake or olivia blake who is extremely sophisticated in her writing is just like also she has massive boobs like so great all Um, good to know all important details she gets a list of instructions with this house that the night before she's stuck in a hotel um Mm -hmm. and so she like needs to spend some time doing something gotta honestly practice all of those steps to correctly get into the house (laughs) like stepping in with both feet which would be like do you jump in I would think so. Like I, I okay. didn't like there's a bunch of instructions on what she has to do, but like we'll get into why this happens later. Um, but she goes to this bar that's like supposed to be a vampire themed bar. And you know, it's New Orleans, it's the French Quarter. Um it's just black sheep in Des Moines. <laughs> yes, it's black sheep in Des Moines, if you know, if you uh you know. Um, but she so it's kind of kitschy, but it's also um like dark and hot people are there, right? And uh, very moody. And she run literally runs into this woman, Elizabeth, who is an absolute bombshell. I mean, not only is she gorgeous, but she just, the vibes are immaculate. She Amazing. is, I don't even know who, I wish I had an actor or somebody to compare it to. Like, I would say an Anya Taylor-Joy. Like, like that, that was sharp. A, look, I don't know if you believe me when I tell you that that was who I was thinking in my head. And then you said it, but that's yes. who I was going to imagine in my head. And then you said it. Thank you. Well, I think everybody's kind of got her on their mind because she did just get married. And she, she might've is... just gotten married. I was looking at the picture of her wedding dress today and it was beautiful, but I choose to believe that maybe we've got some psychic energy. <laughs> you know, it is the theme. We come on theme here, we do. Um, but, and I'm also obsessed with Anya Taylor joy, but like, think about like that kind of enrapturing type of woman. Like you right. just can't look away from her. She is yes, confident. She's sexy. She's chic and she's cool. And so, 
Um, there's kind of some passing comments, but Elizabeth kind of makes these like little quirky, I don't want to say quirky, but like kind of sly comments to um, Marisa who like kind of giggles and haha, like, I, I don't know how to interact with this absolutely gorgeous woman. And like, I Elizabeth, awkward. <laughs> yeah. And like Elizabeth is just like not backing down. And there's kind of some weird comments about like, um, I like, like there's just some weird comments that kind of you you figure out later what it's in reference to, but it, it's setting a tone, right? Sure. So Elizabeth says at one point that she used to read a lot. And the great quote is, reading is a lot like cigarettes. And, you know, Marisa's it, it like, what? It destroys your lungs. And yeah, it, Marisa you. says something along the lines <laughs> of like, uh, it's unhealthy. And she's like, it's best enjoyed after sex. Oh, oh. Young yeah, girl, I'm okay. usually tired, but <laughs> good <Yeah>. for you. <laughs> I am hashtag exhausted. Hashtag um, exhausted. So, then so this interaction kind of stays with Marisa, and she's like, Okay, so she was so freaking hot. Um, and the next day is the even new mood, so she can go in the house. It's really old, but it's pretty well kept up. But mm -hmm. kind of think that Victorian gothic style home, sure, right? Sure, sure. And the guest house is in the back and it's locked and there's no way of opening it. But then she, she uh, like goes in, does all of the steps, right? She does all the steps she needs to do to ex like take on the house, right? And she's walking around and she notices there's an umbrella inside the front door where there wasn't one before. And she kind of creeps around. And what do you think she finds? A person? She sure does. She <laughs> finds a man and I don't know who else Another would be umbrella? an umbrella. <laughs> an umbrella with an umbrella. Um, she finds a man in the kitchen making a sandwich, which is where they should be. <laughs> Reverse those <laughs> gender norms. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in the kitchen now? <laughs> we love a self-sufficient man. Um, this man is Jack. Um, after he oh, makes... <laughs> from our last book, <laughs> it's the this same man, Jack. This man is shirtless in jeans with a pumpkin for a head. <laughs> no, as much as I wish that was true, it is not. He smells like fall. <laughs> anyway, he has pumpkin juice. Um, so uh, black he... pubes, though. <laughs> I look. If you don't know what we're talking about, we really just need you to go walk back and listen. Watch, like, listen to the last episode. I um, dare you to. So after he like takes a couple of bites of his sandwich, he makes it disappear. So obviously he's not human, right? Um, it's also clear that this is not just a house. Um, right. Her grandmother was not a normal woman. Um, she was what is called a caretaker. Mm -hmm. And there's always been one in the French Quarter. And it has to do with all these crazy things she had to do to enter the house. So by entering the house in all those sophisticated ways, she technically accepted the role of caretaker taking oh. over for her grandma so like yeah she basically performed like a spell contract yeah. that yes exactly mm -hmm. it's a contract so she made sure. a contract with the house and she didn't even know what she was signing up for which is kind of like not great um but the house think of the house as like a youth hostel for monsters in need okay sure yeah so there jack is explaining this to her because there's a knock in the house and she thinks it comes from the front door it does not it comes from a door in the guest house area which she opens and there's a monster standing there and what she has to do is essentially give them passage into a room that they can stay in she cannot go into those rooms oh those are that's their space and so really her job if at the bare minimum is to open these doors and let monsters come in and out right like, like she's essentially running a little B and B. Okay, mm -hmm. think about it that way. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And a like, cute what little are... spooky hotel for spooky little friends. And like, Jack assures her, "Look, they're gonna keep to their own. You're gonna keep to your own. They're not gonna fuck with you. They shouldn't." Like, there's kind of like these. There's a lot of these underlying like rules that it's kind of like almost like the magical rule of laws in the French quarter that people don't fuck with. Right. Sure. So you're yeah. like, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. And we all do that to keep the peace. Right. And the caretaker, think of them as like Switzerland, like the caretaker is not going to get involved with any of the drama going on. No one touches the caretaker. The caretaker is kind of like their own little free country. Okay. Okay. So I asked you to do some research. You did. Because Jack is not just Jack. Jack is Jack St. Germain. Oh, who is Jack? Oh, who is Jacques. 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 Um, 
he is a witch or, and I love that they use the term witch for a man. Uh-huh, uh-huh, um, uh-huh. But he also likes the term alchemist. And he kind of just dis- mm-hmm. like describes like, there's an element of magic that you have inherently that you have to have to practice, but there's also stuff that you can just learn organically. Sure. So some of it's like naturally born talent and some of it's practice. So alchemist, which doesn't matter what you use, but I would like you to give us a brief history on St. Germain. Yes, this is going to be weird. So uh, buckle up and a little bit brief. So unnamed journalist at WGNO uh, and also some resources from the Trebony Parish Library helped me flesh out this research. Um, so thank you to them for that. We're going to keep it a little short and a little sweet. Um, no, <laughs> I should start by saying one of my resources that I was reading said in an article I couldn't find if this is based off a real man or not, which is the vibe for this research. Uh, Just like a little disclaimer to everyone. Nothing. We've already established we are not experts in anything. Yes. Uh, Overarching rule for all of the things I've researched for this episode in particular is that there there is an interweaving of maybe some factuality, but also a lot of like myth, legend, lore. So Mm -hmm. we get a little hazy. Um, All of that to say... No one knows where uh, Count de Saint Germain, aka Comte Saint Germain, aka Count the Count of Saint Germain, aka Count of Racoche. Wow, that's a lot uh, of titles. Yeah, he is from or was. Uh, nobody knows where he was from or where he was born, but he was a socialite who was reportedly born maybe around the 1600s and then lived for around 2,000 years. Uh, King so, Frederick of Great 2,000 years. Yeah. 2000 years starting in the 1600s. Yep. Okay. Just around there again again 2000. Oh, so you're saying but think of the words born, I'm saying it's all crazy. <laughs> was he born in the 1600s or that's just when he came to notoriety? Um, I couldn't tell you. Okay, sorry. Couldn't I'm just the you. math ain't math and I'm not that great this, at math. This so. is born in the 1600s and lived for 2000 years, but again, lots of varying Who stories knows? of how long this dude did or didn't live and when he was or wasn't around. Great. Um, we're, it's just a fun world we're living with. I can tell you that, assuming he's a real person, King Frederick, the Great of Prussia, once said that he was a man who could not die. So we can at least agree that he was nice. living a long time and kind of eccentric. Um, that person is known to kind of be a socialite. That person, I saw a lot of references to being an alchemist. I'm saying that person for uh, a specific reason, which is that uh, Jacques Saint-Germain, who is who my research is about and who we've just heard of in the story, um, apparently came to New Orleans, uh, uh, lived on Royal Street in the early 1900s, and he claimed to be a direct descendant of Count St. Germain, but also some legends say he just is St. Germain with a fake name because he's a vampire who lives... For- what I'm telling you is that this guy is Keanu Reeves. He is a vampire who travels through time and lives forever. Look, I'm that's not what I'm complaining. saying. I'm not complaining. So kind of keep that in your back. He either, either Jacques is, sorry, can you hear them bark? Yeah, that's fine. Just write that note. Anyway, my dogs are so crazy. Either, um, either Jacques Saint Germain is this Count Saint Germain, this, uh, man who couldn't die, who lived for thousands of years. Um, legend is basically like he lived for years and years. And at one of those times he lived in new Orleans and he went under this name. Um, but he was all of the, Either way, he was famous for throwing what I imagine to be big, great Gatsby-like parties at his house in New Orleans, but reportedly never ate the food or drank what all the guests were drinking along with his party guests. Apparently, he instead drank seemingly red wine from an ornate chalice. Oh. Seemingly red wine. Uh, We're going to give a light trigger warning against violence against women because I have to bring up an event. Um, If you'd like to skip that, go right ahead just know that this guy is again keanu reeves uh ageless never never aging vampire um one night in november in a date not given to me in any of my resources a woman escaped from jacques home by leaping out of a window and she told police that he had attacked her with a knife and tried to drink her blood uh which is bad police classically did not believe this woman (laughs) So they decided they were going to ask Jacques what happened, but also in a very police way, decided to wait until the next morning. Uh, nice. <laughs> we believe in uh, women in this house, by the way. Yeah. 
Yeah, we do. Uh, so they tra- they went to go ask Jock what happened in the morning, but when they went back to Jock's house, he was gone and never to return. Ooh. Oh my god! Apparently, police found blood stains under the carpets, no food on the property, and wine bottles and glasses filled with blood all in the house. Ooh. Oh. Um. Apparently, his legend is the inspiration for Anne Rice's character Lewis in Interview with a Vampire. I'm so glad you mentioned all that because I didn't write it down here in my little plot points, but uh, they, he actually addresses this and he makes it clear. I am not a vampire. I'm not. <laughs> um, it's also implied that he may have stole the identity. This Jack may have stole the identity from a former Jack St. Germain Interesting. Um, or like a former St. Germain, the, the count. Um, sure, sure. And that he that has tracks. been living as the count for all of these hundreds of years yes. or whatever. And then they also, he was like, people bring up the whole incident with the woman. And he's like, that was just a misunderstanding. Like <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible misunderstanding. I promise I did not kill her. I, she was. I know that I'm okay. drinking seemingly blood out of goblets, but, <laughs> but I'm not a vampire. And I did not push that woman out my window or anything along those lines. But yeah. Um, he, he did get like banished for a time after that from yeah. New Orleans, uh, which sure. explains the whole missingness. And then he like has come back obviously since, mm-hmm. but okay. Yes. So- In summary, no one could really agree a hundred percent as to whether he is the same person as that count just continually living yes. or is a different person taking on that name who happens to look exactly like that person. But you just got to know that apparently they're identical and they're either the same dude or related. Who can say spooky? He we is, no however, idea. referred to as a vampire of New Orleans in a lot of different sources. So I don't know what to tell you about the dispute. I, it's not not for me to step into about whether he is or isn't a vampire. The important thing is that you've given us the background we need for this story. Yes. So yes. turns out there's a lot of monsters running around New Orleans and um, let alone the region at large. But the, we're going to talk about like specifically stuff going on in New Orleans, French yeah. Quarter proper. It's a real Hotel Transylvania over there. If you need a visual image, um, I, I had a guy, I had an actor in mind when I was talking about, I don't think he's like wide enough known. He was in um, The Discovery of Witches. Um, he was like the main male character on that. Oh, I can't remember his name. And he was like in, for a short time, he was in... Um, what am I thinking? Uh, Downton Abbey. He was like the love interest yeah. after that. Uh, Mary's is, husband. Is his had... name Matthew Good? Yes, or... it's Matthew Good. Thank you. Don't Thank thank you me. Up. Thank Google. Uh, well, that's who I envision <laughs> because he's he's like suave and he's charming and he's kind of like like tall and and, and lean and he's um he's got like a quirkiness to him, but he's not as like smooth and dark as elizabeth right like he's a little more charming right um so after this weird tutorial about the house he like takes her for a drink because she's like this is a lot to deal with they go to a speakeasy that's specifically for monsters of the french quarter and they run into elizabeth turns out elizabeth is a vampire and jack is adamant that marisa should stay away from her he's like don't go around her she's fucking psychotic She will kill you. She kills on the dime. Like she's terrible, terrible person. Okay. Turns out she's like allegedly really dangerous. And at the bar that she met Marisa at the night before that kitschy vampire theme bar, that's Mm -hmm. actually like kind of insinuated to be like a tourist trap for, for Elizabeth and her sisters to have like a real drink. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, yeah. So Marisa goes to the bathroom and runs into Elizabeth who knows that she's the new caretaker. And she also tells Marisa that Jack cannot be trusted. So who are you How trusting? Complex. Who are you trusting at this point? Just give me a name. Who? Okay. Who nobody. I'm trusting nobody. <laughs> I'm trusting myself. <laughs> who would you be more, if you had to trust one individual, who would you be more inclined to trust? Uh, mm. Well, I mean, really, I don't feel like I know either of these people. So I guess I'll pick the hottest. <laughs> and which one's the hottest to you in this? Scene? I don't know. I guess so, they're both hot. Ev- I'm trusting everyone who's hot in this scenario. So <laughs> I am taking really conflicting advice and trying to make it all work because every, everybody around me is so hot. 
I just can't, I can't have a reason in my brain. Um, so switching back to Jack's point of view and what you'll realize is like, you kind of start justifying different things for different characters um, right. because you'll hear something and you'll be like, that's unforgivable. And then you get to their point of view and they have a reason behind what they did. And you're like, okay, all well, right. Turns maybe out it's I'll... not all black and white. Sometimes it's gray, like a ghost. Sure is. It's a little, uh, you know, the opacity is a little off and you're like, oh, can't quite, mm. can't quite get there. I'm so blinded by the hotness. Um, so switching to Jack's point of view, it's clear he hates Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. She has broken cardinal rules of the territory, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it includes like no recreational hunting, no turning on your own kind. Like, so vampires can't turn on vampires, witches mm -hmm. on witches, all that. Mm -hmm. And it also turns out that she's a casket girl. Would no. you like to provide us with a brief history of the casket girls? Which uh, I yes. Think this is gets muddy, you said. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I titled this section of the research Casket Girls, Casket Sisters. Um, the other one was titled The Legend of Keanu Reeves. I mean, Jacques Saint Germain, in case you were curious. Uh, I mostly just titled them for myself, but now you know. Um, thank you so much to, again, the Trevany Parish Library System, the New York Historical Society's uh, Women in the American Story Project, WGNO again, and uh, Michael DeMacher writing for very local because those are my sources any who's will be um i have never been fortunate enough to visit new orleans but i am familiar with its reputation for being a spooky okie city um and haunted new orleans tours can be found here there and around the square and my understanding is that ghosts are as plentiful as beignets these are all things i wrote about new orleans you're welcome um a common story about new orleans and within all of that lore and there's tons of it and it varies and i tried my best everybody is the lore of the casket girls of ursuline of the Ursuline convent. Um, and every time I see convent, know that in my head, I'm seeing coven because I'm in a big spooky season vibe. So if I say coven on accident instead of convent, I'm sorry. It's a reasonable excuse. I wish it was a coven. That sounds more fun. Anyway, <laughs> uh, in the early 1700s, Louisiana was having a hard time as uh, an up and coming French colony. And it's specifically guys were not getting it in they had a population problem. Uh, it was a tough time for everybody involved. You know, I, I heard that, you know, pumpkin demons um, may or may yeah. not have, you know, pumpkin spice latte um, ejaculation. And it's maybe they always, should just really invest in that. Like, why does it always, always have to be women? First of all, why? Second of all, it's possible that these men are just only giving their juices without the seeds. We can't know for sure. We that couldn't say. <laughs> Go listen to the last episode if you don't know what we're talking about. Anyway, to describe this bad time, I pulled what I found to be a very funny quote from the Trevity Parish Library. It, they said, <clears throat> New Orleans hit a rough time, as New Orleans tends to do. The men of the new city needed eligible women to marry so the population could grow. That was the whole point of France sending settlers to the area. The problem was early New Orleans women weren't deemed eligible enough uh, being too loose, being too Choctaw, too African, or too, I've taken a vow of chastity, sir, please leave me alone to make good mothers. And in quotes, it says they were just too picky. Yeah. <laughs> I think they mean the men. But I'd be, like, the women, I think, have the right to. So to handle this, the governor at the time, whose name is long in French, so I don't feel like saying it, no. uh, but you may look it up if you'd like did what any rational person would do, which is ask the French government to send over some virgins. Please and thank you. Oh my Please gosh. send us virgins so that these men can get married. Um, so yeah, he asked the French government to send, quote, good virgin women who could be who could be married to the male French colonists in the ter territory, which sounds bad, but a similar move had been made in New France in the 1600s. And apparently in that instance, it all worked out. So apparently this is a thing you can do. French. apparently the thing you can do wild i know it's it's super weird so yeah um the government was like yeah sure we'll send you over some virgins for marrying or whatever but instead of using whatever vetting process they used the first time which i believe was uh that king louis whichever one was uh ruling in the 1600s proclaimed that any woman who agreed to move to new france to marry colonists would receive free passage and the uh, across the Atlantic and a small dowry. And what didn't happen this time around is that instead, when we're brought from orphanages, poorhouses, or were already convicted criminals before they came over. So oh. instead of being like, hey, ladies, if you want to go over, we'll uh, take you and give you money, they were like, 
come here, sad people, sad women, sad kids. Uh, I read somewhere that like there were some families who would like send women they didn't like or want to be around anymore, like made them. It's it's not cool. Is what I'm saying. But, like <laughs> Agatha's being a real snot. I'm sick of her bullshit. But on a logical side, why would you not sit back and think, hey, we're about to offer, you know, free passage to the new world for new opportunities and all these things. And honestly, France isn't that great right now, TBH. And um, you wouldn't get people who are low income and very much need the opportunity. Like, of yeah, course, like the government the could have done it the nice way like they did the first time. They just chose to not do it. <laughs> Wait, are you saying that they like forced them to go? Yeah, they just like grabbed. Oh. They were just like, we got give us orphans. Give us some ladies in jail. Are you poor? Get on over here. Okay, go. now I'm understanding this. <laughs> yeah, orphans would be like, take my shitty kid. <laughs> oh, Lord. Just take her. Um, It was it was uh, no bueno. Um, So not great. These uh, women became known as the casket girls. Because they were named after these trunks that they were given to put their belongings in on the way over. Um, please note that these trunks were pretty small and not necessarily what I would consider to be standard vampire size. But I digress. Um, okay. The name comes from the, the casket is not like caskets we know today. Yeah. It's like yeah. the name of this kind of a trunk that they all came with when they popped on over on their boat. Uh, <laughs> these So yeah. Uh, these women were described as being deathly pale, gaunt, malnourished. One article referred to them as being otherworldly looking. Uh, wow, right. standards. Well, I'm going to say it's probably from being chained up and forced to take a long ass boat ride from France to Louisiana. But you, I mean, yeah, maybe they're vampires. <laughs> can't be can't be good for the skin. I yeah, mean. and or they could be vampires. But as uh, upon arrival, they went and resided in this Ursuline uh, covenant which is uh, run by Ursline nuns. Yes. The covent is the covent. Now I just want to say convent. Convent. Thank you. You were Co- missing the co- an N in there. They're not witches. They're nuns. <laughs> they are nuns. Shocker. Anyway. So uh, nuns took these women in. Uh, the building is still, you can see it in New Orleans. Like there's like a museum in it now. And also I think a church. And also I think you can do weddings there. Um, but it is time, also mentioned in the book. I don't get into it, but yes, they they talk about it there. Nice. So yeah, it at the time it was housing the nuns and also served as an orphanage and a school for girls. Uh, in particular, it is noted that the casket girls were sent to live on the third floor attic with their spooky or <laughs> spooky coffin boxes spooky. at their beds. Um, from this point in my story on, it's going to get wacky. Uh, Because we're shifting into, like, various folklore legends about this group of women. Um, And different people said different stuff. And my brain really struggled to put a piece all together. But uh, base facts. We have a group of uh, thin, gaunt, pale women from France. Um, They are (laughs) forced into a new country with a spooky suitcases that we like can't get over we're super obsessed with them i can't know why i um, mean kind of trendy really into their suitcases um some say that bad stuff started happening to people in the area after the girls came like crops were dying or neighbors were getting sick or whatever and uh it must be because of the casket girls and so then we kind of split into a variety of rumors there are some rumors that said the casket girls brought evil with them and uh that's why all these bad things were happening and as a result, uh, the nuns threw the casket girls out. And in this version of this story, this is where I get a little hair on what's fact and what's fiction. Um, a, several years later, one of my sources said, a guy repairing the convent's roof found the empty uh, caskets left on that third floor attic and uh, reported to someone that the casket girls must have smuggled vampires in from Europe. Oh, yeah, was well, he, he basically he got up to the he saw the attic from the roof, saw these caskets, was like, those are definitely vampire caskets. Those casket girls must have brought vampires here, and yeah. they are killing people. Um, so that's that's one way. Uh, apparently, people believe that vampires wanted to return to their caskets on the covens, hub, convent, every, 
On just, events. I'll just chime in for you during this. It's just like, <laughs> no, give me a like, nudge. I'll do a nudge. I, apparently, the vampires were dying to get to the convent's third floor to get back to their coffins. So the windows were permanently dying. sealed. Huh. I can tell you that the third floor, like, attic windows of this building are shuttered. Allegedly, they are sealed with 800 screws made of silver that yes. were originally blessed in Rome by the Pope and that allegedly Pope John Paul II re-blessed uh, in his visit in 1987. These anti-vampire screws. I can tell you, yeah, the, the windows are shutters. I don't know about the anti-vampire properties of the screws held within. Um, that is one tangent. So it's like uh, these women brought over vampires with them and that sucks. And now there's vampires here, and it's the casket girl's fault for bringing them in their tiny little caskets. I should They're also <laughs> mention, too, that um, the screws and stuff are mentioned in the book. Amazing. And they're like, oh, this does not hold you out. And she's like, no, I mean, it's not great for my skin, but it's <laughs> I got a rash. It is what it is. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. I chafe. Um, there are other versions of the casket girl story that say the caskets themselves are empty because the casket girls sleep in them during the day and then go out with the, and take their creepy pale selves out and run amok at night to prowl for victims. So like maybe the casket girls are the vampires. <laughs> That's I, I saw that it, there's just a mix of different ways. So it's like either they brought vampires or they were vampires and either way, these ladies are really fucking up our shit. Um, I can tell you that from my understanding, historically, most of the casket girls were married. Uh, within six months of arriving and uh my last bit of my research is a quote i pulled from the new york historical society that said quote over time many of the casket girls were able to establish themselves uh, as part of the fabric of louisiana society but their triumph does not erase that they were imported perhaps against their will to serve the sexual and procreative needs of the colony's men so thank you tldr Maybe these women are brought or are vampires. Either way, they were brought here against their will to make kids. Yeah. And that, like, okay. <laughs> I think this needs to be discussed more because, like, the United States, we have some really terrible history. And I feel like we should just add that one to the list. True. Um. Anyway. True. Well, is is that your research? That is it. All? Thank you Concluded. very much. I... Um, there's also mention that there was like a time of like illness where a lot of women died after coming in in the book. Yes. I don't know how real that is. I I well I what I what I saw in research is like yeah all these women were brought over. A lot of them inherently died on the journey because yes. back in the day people died coming over long distances on boats. So yes. I think that's part of it. And also they were all like super sick, like again from being on a boat. So yeah, so there's like reference to that in which yeah. so to give context to Elizabeth's character, she feels like she's really close with these quote unquote sisters who are other casket girls. They're not mm -hmm. actual biological sisters, but some of these women, because they are vampires, first of all, and because they survived all this terrible shit to get here, right? Mm -hmm. I saw um, it in at least one place mentioned that like maybe they were or weren't all changed together down on the boat. That is um, mentioned in the book too. Yeah. Yeah, that they were all chained in like some of the bodies may like and this is fictional on my side, but like some mm -hmm. of the bodies may have been just dead and chained to each other. And oh, like no. Wait, we need to oh, stop no. doing that shit, America. Um, anyway, so now hopping back into our story, you are now realizing after some of these conversations that there is a turf war in the French Quarter in New mm -hmm. Orleans. Um specifically between like Elizabeth's group of people and Jack's group of people. So like there was kind of a line drawn in the sand of like Elizabeth has to stay on that side of the city and she's like not allowed on this side. And Jack is like going to stay on this side and not probably go to that side. And Elizabeth has been kind of coming over because there's been attacks on her sisters and mm -hmm. one in particular who did die. And so like she's pissed off and she's trying to like get answers of like what happened. Right. So the caretaker is kind of, like I said, like the middle of the rope. So mm -hmm. both uh, both of them really want Marisa on their side because it kind of dictates whether or not they can roam freely and like sure. gives them a lot of leverage. So you're also going to find out that they, there's a lot of history between Elizabeth and Jack that the reader doesn't know yet. But he did know her before she was even a vampire. 
So they knew each other back in France. Nice. Um, so there's a lot of sexual undertones to all of this. Like this book is like, if you wrung it out, it's like dripping with sexual tension constantly. So is like, the conversation more like we hate each other, but it's hot. <laughs> like, it's like how, like, there's even a line at one point where Jack was like, it is exhausting being in love and hating this woman. Like <laughs> it is exhausting being obsessed with her, but at the same time, I want to kill her all the time. So, but like, there's this also like, oh, I'm so attracted to you and I understand that. And I can even verbally admit, admit it to you, but we also know that I absolutely hate your guts. Right. Right. So, but then meanwhile, like Marissa's the new, or sorry, Marisa is the new player in all of this. She is, beautiful in a lot of senses and um intriguing she's a new caretaker she's alluring uh because of her position too and so now jack and elizabeth are attracted to her too so she's kind of now you're gonna see polyamorous themes in this not necessarily yeah, not necessarily but like they're all sharing a little sure, bit sure um so everyone a, likes everyone else yes it's a very well constructed tr love triangle Fun. Um, there is a scene where Marisa is forced to join Elizabeth as she brings one of her uh, seduced men from her bar into a back alley to kill him. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly showing how dangerous she is. And Marisa's a little nervous, but it's also showing that Elizabeth is doing this to call out toxic masculinity. And specifically she's killing men because he, they are gross, like picking up women, maybe not even always consensually, yeah, it's like, it's like murder, murderers. Yes, it's like I'm going to murder the bad people. And so she gets this Ch Ch Chad guy to um kill, like to die. Um, and then Marisa thinks Elizabeth's gonna drink his blood when he dies, but Elizabeth is like, No, your body's a temple, quote, don't fill it with toxic shit. So you find out that like there was this perception that Elizabeth was killing these people, these tourists in her bar. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. She's killing terrible men who are doing Because if she would, then she would get maybe like really drunk. Is it like that? <laughs> Is it like if you drink a lot? If no. the person you drink drinks a lot, do you get a little drunk too? I don't, but I think it's more of a like, he's a gross person. I would never drink his blood. Right. Like right. even if I needed it, I don't want it from somebody like him. Um, so then that's where you start realizing that the perception Jack has of Elizabeth that he's telling Marisa and of Elizabeth has of Jack that he's, she's telling Marisa is that like, they're all convoluted. Right. Right. Um, so it sounds like Jack is also kind of a reformed bad boy. Like he used to do a lot of killing and like tricks and, but he's gone soft in recent years. And this is coming directly from Elizabeth's mouth. So I feel like that's kind of trustworthy information. It's not like him mm -hmm. trying to sell himself as a good boy. Um, also, he made the necklace that Elizabeth wears so she can walk in the sun. If that tells you anything about their past relationship. Sure. Like at one point they were close enough that he had made her this necklace. Yes. So Jack close shares enough. their history from his point of view, which is that he fell in love with her back in France when they both had nothing. She was an orphan and he had nothing to his name. And he went and met the real St. Germain and kind of fell under his control. And when Jack mm -hmm. got free and he went and found Elizabeth after she became a casket girl, because she had to, she was forced to, and she was a vampire by that point, And she kind of had lost her humanity. And he says that there was nothing left of her that he had loved about her, right? She was a monster. And he viewed that part as a betrayal in his eyes. That's um, so that's some background on them. Now there's this demon who comes to the house and threatens. Is it Jack from the last book? I, I wish it was. We already got one Jack in this book. We cannot possibly take another. Keep so, getting my hopes up. The demon's message, and this is very important, the wording, okay? Demon's message to Marisa says that if she does not claim her own life, it will be claimed by the people she has wronged. And Jack attacks the messenger. And before the messenger dies, he asks, who sent you? And the demon says, Elizabeth. When you go to Elizabeth's point of view, you find out that she spoke to the messenger, that demon, at one point about the killings of her sisters, but nothing about Marisa. Like she said, I, there, she's didn't put out any hit. Okay, right. But Jack, you know, kills this demon. Marisa is very scared. 
after the attack. They maybe do some kissing. He's comforting her. And then it is definitely fade to black implied that they have sex because they end up having kind of a pillow talk conversation afterward. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, there's fade to black in this book, so much sexual tension. There's also a lot of comparisons between the characters. So like, Jack, after having sex with Marisa, is like, I like he has like these flashbacks to having sex with Elizabeth when they were together. But also he's like, but Elizabeth was wild and untamed, whereas Marisa is sweet and soft and like demure. And so he's like kind of comparing them, but not in a way of pitting them against each other. He's just like, it's just a different experience. Sure. And then you know, then Elizabeth is kind of jealous of Jack's time with Marisa and like all this, it's, it's it's like this circle, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Now Elizabeth isn't the only killer. Jack is also killed. And it sounds like he has justifications behind the murders because he's done it largely for the good of the mortals. Right. Um, Because he, his mentality is like, there was this woman, do you remember the French lore around um, Daphne, Daphne, Delphine? No, I don't think I've ever heard of Gosh, I I wish I had her name. I I wasn't going to pull this out for the book, but um, there was a French woman who had had, uh, slaves in her house and um, in the French quarter, and they found out that she had terribly tortured them. I'm so sorry. I should have given a trigger warning. Um, But there was just terrible, terrible, terrible things that had happened in that house. Anyway, so in the book, he says that that was a demon that he had killed her because he had like driven her back to France and killed her because he was like, she was just, whether she was doing it in the French quarter in France, she was going to do it either way. Like Mm -hmm. I needed to do it because she was doing terrible things to mortal people. And so his killing is also now justified. So just to give more context behind, like you kind of think these people are terrible, but we're all getting away with it. Yes. So, um, Due to Elizabeth's attempt on Maurice's life, she is now blacklisted, which means she kind of, um, it's kind of like free open season, like free reign on, on killing her. You know, like if, yeah. if somebody were to happen to kill Elizabeth, they would not have any consequences. And so Elizabeth is obviously concerned about herself and her sisters, the other casket girls. So Elizabeth visits Marisa and realized Marisa has had sex with Jack. She was like, that wasn't even me trying to mind read you. That's just like, I know that he makes this little meal after every time he has sex. Uh, so like, don't think you're special. Um, but she's aw. not jealous. <laughs> she, she's like, I'm not jealous. It's just like, it's just who he is. Like, uh, so again, all the sexual tension is stirring and she tries to convince Marisa that she did not send the hit out on her. And mm-hmm. she's so alluring and she's so beautiful and all this stuff that if I read this correctly, cause it's kind of, like blurry but elizabeth pushes an image into marisa's mind of what it would be like if they made out in that moment so like she kind of blurs reality and Mm -hmm. mental images so that like marisa's kind of getting hot and bothered because she's like do i like do i taste like him after you've slept with him like do you you have any interest in me and myself and i which is like super hot but also kind of weird um There's another scene. You should where, ask first before you <laughs> astral project your face and make out with another person. There's a pattern opinion. to these conversations too, where she has one conversation with Elizabeth, kind of gets on her side, goes back, talks to Jack, gets on his side, goes back to Elizabeth, gets on her side. So you find out that Marisa is very smart, but she's also very insecure and she's depending mm-hmm. heavily on these people she just met. So there's another scene where Marisa sneaks out to the convent. And uh, seeks out Elizabeth for an unsettling conversation. Um, And she goes to find her only to like kind of realize that she has these weird feelings ever since she accepted the house. Right. She's like, there's something building in me. And Elizabeth explains it's kind of like the, all those creatures, those magical creatures you're around, they mm-hmm. leave off like dandruff or like stray hairs of magic. Consider it like kind of visualize it like that. Magical right? Magical dandruff. Well, not magical dandruff, but like they're shedding just glitter. <laughs> just glitter. Um, but they're magical shedding dandruff. magic in certain areas around her because she's always around it. And it's just sticking on her. Right. So she's kind of building magic within her. Sure. She's and just full of it, magic. Yes. So she's got the magic in her. 
but she doesn't have the magical pumpkin lube unfortunately True. um so this uh it also turns out that jack made the magic behind the house that makes it the magical little hostel house oh. and this well, he can use because he's created that he can use the magic from marisa or whoever the caretaker is so this now gives a motive for him to be on marisa's good side because he can use her right he right. can use the magic she's accumulating and that that like so then after this whole revelation um they end up having this really steamy moment like kind of a dub so like dom sub moment mm -hmm. where elizabeth is kind of egging marisa on to like you got to take what you want you know like you gotta go for it take the life you want and like if you don't want to be out the caretaker don't be the caretaker but also if you you want to be with a woman like me. Well, also, if you want to have sex with me, that's fine. Yeah. And so th if there's fade to black, but again, very good sexual tension. Um, and after they're done having sex during pillow talk, uh, Elizabeth Loki tells Marisa she needs to kill Jack if she wants out of the contract with the house because he was the one that. Yeah. So uh. <laughs> it's kind of like pulling out the rug that's like, hey, we just had this really sweet moment, but. Well, oh, here you go. Be the bearer of bad news. Okay, so do you want to hear something really fun? Always. Marisa's grandma never tech. Well, she did die, but no one ever saw her body. Oh, and that's fun. This is kind of discovered in this weird conversation um, with her and another character. And um, this other character I haven't brought up yet because he's not really important until this point in the plot. I'm going to call him Augie because it's like Aguilard. Ag Aguilard, I think mm. is his name. Anyway, um, Aggie is what I'm going to call him. So he's not very important, but if you need to see who he is in like the picture of the monster society, he mm. is like a vampire politician of the French Quarter. Like think of him as he owns that speakeasy bar. Mm -hmm. He kind of like sets mm -hmm. the rules or like helps enforces the rules. Sure um but he's very much a politician and he takes to jack's side typically okay even though he's men. a vampire i know men only believe men um and you realize in one of these conversations that it might be implied that he sent the demon after marisa to give a reason to oust elizabeth to put her oh. on the blacklist oh i see mm -hmm. and then you start realizing that uh mm -hmm. aggie is the one stirring the pot so he can look stable to the other creatures as a politician like he is killing randos and blaming it on elizabeth he is also doing this shady shit to jack too and so he's kind of making them look like they're more at odds with one another right i'm about to drop a lot of plot on you next okay i'm in the zone okay Jack also, remember when I said that he ran off to France to kill that one demon woman? Mm -hmm. That was Aggie's twin sister. Oh. Whoop. Okay. Oops. So put that on the back burner in your head. Okay. Noted. We now find out the backstory of Maurice's grandmother, which isn't super important. But what you do need to know is that, you know, Jack made the house, made the caretaker role. He didn't quite know what he was doing because the magic began leaking from his little spell into the caretaker. So all that magic that's like manifesting in Marisa now mm -hmm. isn't supposed to be happening and it's definitely not healthy. So oh, grandma didn't embrace the magic and instead that magic slowly started to kill her. Like she went blind. She started getting really sick. All of these things that could likely happen to Marisa unless she embraces it which if she does if she does embrace it it would make her immortal right she would become a creature herself mm -hmm. grandma found out um sorry aggie found out about jack's magic um which is tied to the house and he started blackmailing him okay so he's like hey you're gonna start doing what i want you to because I know this little secret about your little house that is supposed to be like this pinnacle of the community. And it turns out you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> so you're going to do what I tell you. And grandma 
overheard this conversation and she was like, I want out of this contract. So I'm going to kill Jack. So she was going to go kill Jack, but Aggie stopped her because he was like, I've got Jack exactly where I want him. I don't need you killing him and messing up my plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he kills grandma. Oh man. Really sad stuff. Grandma becomes a ghost. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, plot twist aggie is not actually a vampire would you like to guess what aggie is Hmm. Hmm. in the world of monsters what do i want aggie to be you should know already because i told you who his twin sister is oh wait you've got it i told you what his twin sister was tell me that again no, I'm not going to tell you it. I don't like, remember. I just wrote down that okay. she's dead in my notes. My big takeaway was dead. Aggie is a demon because his oh, sister was a demon. Demon, demon, and, so, demon. and that's a lot scarier than a vampire. So yes. he's, and he's not just any demon. He's a very, very powerful demon because him and his sister were very powerful demons. And obviously his sister was very much hated in New not Orleans. Not that par- powerful, apparently. <laughs> but like his sister was hated for what she did, right? And yeah, so like yeah, if people yeah. found out who his sister was too, it would also create a lot of drama. So then Jack's like, I've got this shit on you. So they're all holding secrets against each other. Okay? It's all bad. Um. So Jack goes to elizabeth and tries to convince her that it's all aggie in which they realize like aggie killed grandma um and he aggie killed grandma and got the magic that was in grandma um that was tied to the house Mm -hmm. right um but then jack killed the sister which he got that demon energy too that that demon magic Uh 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 which is tied to aggie So you can see how this is getting really messy. Like everybody's magic is starting to just. Everyone's glitter is just all mixed together. Everybody's pulling from each other's magic and that's not good or healthy or anything. And like pretty much Aggie's like, what if I just had all the magic? What if I just killed all the people involved in this situation, took all the magic back? Right. Uh So what if I killed Marisa? What if I killed the caretaker and just took back all this magic? Right. That would get messy. So I should also mention that the monsters who have been checking in at the house Mm -hmm. have not been checking out. And that is because Aggie has been killing them to take their magic. Oh, no, that's no good. No good. No good all around. So if you remember the wording of the message, do you remember what the message was earlier from the hit that she... uh, yeah, it was like you have to take your life or your was it your enemies will take it for you or someone will take it for you? Um, it is oh, I wrote a note. If uh sorry, <laughs> no, I, I need to find it. If she did not claim her own life, those who have been uh, wronged will c- claim it. Okay. And and I'll note claim, not take. So there's a chance we could interpret it different, and it doesn't mean she's gotta off herself. <laughs> yes, yes. And so um she gets cornered by Aggie in the house. Marisa does. Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of this moment happens when she puts all the pieces together in her brain. And she was like, Hey, remember when I had like the 24 hour deadline to either take care of my own life or somebody would come and take care of it for me. Um, Actually, she just waited out that 24 hour period and then shows up and Aggie's cornering her. And Aggie is like, ha ha, I'm going to kill you. And Marisa's like, Haha, ha, actually all of those monsters that you tried to that you killed in this house are going to actually come and get you first. LOL. LOL, the the monsters that wrong you reclaiming um, my magic. Yes, yeah, so Aggie there's like this giant explosion that happens and Aggie like explodes and like Aggie's out of the picture now. Aggie's dead and gone. Great. Nice. Okay. So Elizabeth and Jack walk in to find Marisa and she's kind of got this set look in her face. And before anybody can do anything, she grabs a knife that Jack had on his side and he, she stabs him. Oh, mm-hmm. Oh, and I want to remind you that Elizabeth just gave her this whole lesson of like, do what you got to do, girl, take what you want. And, yeah. and the best part is that Marisa says like the confident woman she is, Quote, sorry, Jack, nothing personal. These living arrangements just aren't working for me. 
<laughs> She's like, I'm fucking done with this contract that I got Wait, conned into. Man, I hate this. This is so dumb. Do you know how um, hard it is to enter a house with both feet? Yeah. Jumping? What? Wild. Um, so now Elizabeth and Marisa are alone. Jack is deceased well i mean he's dying or something um but he's not he's just like in pain in the corner like no you two go ahead i'll just you guys you guys go ahead i'll just uh take a take a second it's Um, fine (laughs) what do you think happens next do they make out i would love that to be true what would you Um, what would you do if you were in the in this room as either character as whichever one you prefer (laughs) Just also stab Elizabeth and like, I'm done with both of you. I'm sick of you both. <laughs> I'm sick of you both. This is so much drama. <laughs> so Marisa asks, did you even love me? And oh, Elizabeth, that's not what I would have done at all. <laughs> no. And I mean, they've only known each other for a couple of days. So I'm really confused. But Wild. Elizabeth was like, I don't know. Like, that's an emotion. I don't even know how to feel anymore. And Mar- Marissa just, sorry, Marisa um, just hands elizabeth the stake in her hand and grabs her purse and is like you understand right and then like leaves <laughs> like she's like you know what this is not great so um we are coming to the end of our story is there any other like knots that you'd like to have tied up to finish so, like is there anything on your mind still just point of clarification so Jack stabbed, forget about him. Elizabeth handed a wooden stake to is it steak or something. No, sorry, Marisa. Uh-huh. That stake she used to kill Jack, she like hands it because there's kind of this moment of like, is she gonna stab Elizabeth? Uh-huh. And she just like turns the, the handle over and just hands it to her. Oh, okay. So Elizabeth is just standing there in front of her ex-boyfriend's body dead ex sorry about that is there anybody else you feel like you need to know about i I don't think so i feel i feel pretty uh pretty end tied so here's the ending um we the final moments are seen through the eyes of grandma the ghost oh yeah grandma the ghost grandma the ghost and um elizabeth gives jack some of her blood and he heals and comes back to life that's not fun (laughs) and grandma then kind of goes into the light or whatever metaphorical element of passing on that you would like to know from that she passes through the veil and there's this great i didn't include marisa's sister because she's not important to the plot at all um but marisa calls her sister from the airport and is like i'm coming home this was like wild i'm done with new orleans (laughs) this is such (laughs) bullshit i'm so sick of it (laughs) i'm so done I would also like you to note that on top of there being absolutely gorgeous art throughout this whole book, like every few chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, I'm, I'm going to show you in the, like, Ooh, that's um, beautiful. Uh, there's another one. There's kind of like a threesome looking scene um, uh, where that's a spicy meatball. Yeah. And look, look, it's just all gorgeous. And then like, here's, you can, uh, here's Marisa holding oh, awesome. a knife. And then, like, you see our two other characters here. Mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm, on top mm -hmm. of that, Marisa is reading a historical romance novel that you get snippets of throughout the book. That historical romance novel is Elizabeth and Jack's romance when they were back in... Oh. when they're back in france it turns out elizabeth's casket sister is a writer and she wrote their oh. love story into a book that marissa ends up reading so that is our book that is that is though a little weird when you think about how it's like <laughs> a book about your ex is hooking up yeah no i mean the best part is they didn't change the names so like awesome <laughs> great um so what any final thoughts concerns suggestions about our book no, I can't get over the fact that she was reading a uh, well, well, not smutty, maybe smutty. It would be kind of funny if it was smutty. Uh, maybe that's cool. But yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's a little kind bit. of exes, <laughs> our kind of exes, fucking it's um, really something. I, uh, I, I really enjoy this book. I thought it had a really great plot for two hundred pages. It's again, I love her writing. I will never not rave about her. Um, okay, so I also want to go through our scoring here and i did have a link to the cover um you should also know for anybody listening she olivia blake got um purchased or her work got 
um, signed to a publishing house. She was an indie author before. So all of her uh, um, first copies have beautiful, beautiful art, um, but they are no longer available. And so a lot of them are getting reprinted with new covers. I have the original covers to a lot of her books. So the ones that we will be talking about today, I have the original um, uh, first edition book. Um, so cool. it's very dark. So I didn't want to hold it up to you because I wanted you yeah, to see it a little bit better. Zoomed in a lot. So, so let's go through our scoring first. Um, yes. Diversity, I'm going to give it a four because you have creatures, you have different people of different sexual orientations, um, uh, you have different race races also included, um, lots of different culture included. But I mean, it could have been, it wasn't like a five out of five for me. Sure. What yeah. would you give it? I'd say four too. I felt like it was pretty strong. Awesome. What would you give the plot? Also a four. I I'm going to give it a four too. Um, it was great for 400 or sorry, 200 pages. And, um, and like, if you saw the spacing in this too, that was another one that was like, I feel like I'm reading mm -hmm. almost a children's book style writing. Um, <clears throat> smut. I'm sorry. We're going with one. Um, <laughs> the sexual tension is there, but again, we didn't have the smut. Sorry. Not this episode. I, I was giving it a two because, uh, I don't know. I, I enjoy a saucy scene. It's not, yeah. it wasn't super smutty. We didn't have like descriptive stuff, but I, it, it's more than a one for me. So I gave it a two. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually change my answer. I'll go with you on that. I'll go with you yeah. on that. Um, okay. Do you want to describe the cover for us? Yes. So as I said before, I've zoomed in very closely and per usual, Sarah may just uh, correct things that I see wrong. <laughs> um but so the background yeah is very dark and appears to be floral that could be a wallpaper that could just be a bunch of flowers but it's kind of a dark floral background um there's a woman on the cover she is beautiful she has like a brownish golden it's kind of blonde hair it's i want to say she's elizabeth we want to say she's elizabeth i i would well she's not a black woman so yeah i'll tell you spoiler first. alert she also might have fangs. So yeah, a beautiful woman, probably Elizabeth, uh, holding a bouquet of roses, got some petals falling on her shoulder, little like uh, dark kind of off the shoulder dress. It's real cute. Her hair is all up. It says mm -hmm. a little death goes a long way at the top. I and love this that. Is Le Petit Mort. It says our author's name at the bottom. It's beautiful. And they don't make this anymore. That's sad. I know. I, I Look, everybody complains because also the, the first edition of... Um, the Atlas six, I have a copy of it right before she got bought out and it's now going for like a hundred dollars on eBay, this copy, because it is so beautiful. Um, but okay. What would you give the cover? Because I'm going to give it a, a five. Cause I just love it. Like it's so subtle and it's dark and it's got moodiness to it. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. I would give it a five too. I really awesome. like it. I'm sad that they don't print it this way. I know, I know. So we both came out with 15 out of 20, um, which gives us a score of 75%. That's awesome. Uh -huh. Do you have any say smut moments? Um, because it, it didn't get smutty, but like we had a crazy wild kind of plot to it. I do have a say smut moment. It is dumb. <laughs> but no say smut moment toward... is dumb. We'll see what you think after I tell you what this is somewhere very early in the book, I believe you said that Jack made a sandwich, took some bites of it and then disappeared the sandwich. That's your moment. Yeah. That's so wasteful. Why didn't you just eat the rest of the sandwich or save it for later? Oh my gosh. Cause he can just appear with a new one. And like also it's the house takes your whole sandwich. The house takes care of your needs. And so, like, if you, it would never be really wasteful. <laughs> Houses famously love sandwiches. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, okay. I'm so glad that that's what stuck out to you. Yeah, I wrote it down. I know it's early because my notes are <laughs> Marissa, diversity, yay, Elizabeth, vibes. And then my third bullet made sandwich disappeared. What? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will also say like my positive, happy, say smut moment is like, just like the fluidity of sexual tension between yeah, everybody. I and like that, that there was never any jealousy though. Like, and they made that clear. They kept on emphasizing like, and like at one point, like even Marisa was like, what would it be like to have both, you know, like, like 
That's what, what I was asking. And like at one point, her and Elizabeth have a conversation that's like, what would this even look like? Like, I'm going to age and get old and you're going to what become young forever. And I'm just going to stay in this convent with you. Like, I don't know. You know, so there's having these conversations. Couldn't she have, wasn't she going to, didn't she have the option she didn't, to embrace her magic and. She didn't know about that part. That's the hard oh, part. She was like, we there were that. so many elements that like certain people were having conversations, okay, but other sure. people weren't. So that's my like negative say smut moment was like. There was a lot of magical elements being forced mm -hmm. into this that were almost too much with sure. like people getting other people's magic and like, you know, a, de a demon can't pass on unless he he takes care of or they take care of their their responsibility or like their unfinished business. And like there's like so many sub like uh, caveats that I felt like it was almost a little too much. Like I wish that was a little condensed. But look, I loved it. It was a great time for me. I had a bucket of fun. Um, and we'll be back with more smutty content next week. Um, yes. You can find us if you so choose on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at, at say smut. Additionally, we would love to hear your book recommendations. I've got an ongoing list, as you all know. Um, send those our way via email at say smut podcast at gmail.com. Um, like pop us a rating or a review yeah. on the podcast platform of your choosing. Um, don't send us mean stuff. Um, but we want honest stuff. Just don't be mean for mean yeah. sake. That's all we ask. Um, stop hurting my feelings if you are, but if you're not, thank you for not. Yeah. Well, Hey, thanks everybody. And we'll keep you, uh, we'll, we'll I keep you. We'll see you. We will, you. we will keep you, um, in our hearts, in our hearts forever. Um, we will see you at the next spooky one. So yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well,